So I just got a call from my superintendent at the time that I actually just received a new principalship. And I was so excited about this opportunity, uh, the, the opportunity to, to lead a building, right? right? It was just absolutely amazing. And the first person I called was my mom. And so I called my mom and I said, Hey mom, I actually just got a job, a new job in my school district and I'm going to be a principal. And my mom said, you, (laughs) that was the first thing she said, like you are going to lead. And I know that she saw me as her little Georgie, her little baby. And now, you know, growing up, becoming a principal and a little bit when she said that, I was like, me, I, I thought that myself too. Right. And I think a lot of times we don't necessarily see ourselves in leadership roles. We don't see ourselves, you know, necessarily growing a profession because we, you know, a lot of times we see ourselves as those, those kids in high school, those kids in elementary school that maybe they struggled, had a hard time, maybe even excelled in school. And now uh, we're, we're teaching kids, we're, you know, principals, superintendents, things like that. And so I've really been thinking about this a lot, like how we progress to that point. And today in this conversation with Dr. Sean Carey, he's a superintendent in Edenclaw. And what's interesting is that he was a superintendent. He actually started during the pandemic. He spent an entire year where he actually was not in a room with his staff. And the very first day that he got to see his staff all together in one space was the day I actually happened to be speaking to his district. And he did such a wonderful job connecting with the staff and not only connecting with them on that day, but obviously connecting with them throughout, you know, through Zoom, through whatever whatever means he could actually take advantage of. And what I loved about it is that connecting with Sean today and having this conversation, we talked about this idea. He takes the job very seriously. He wants to help. He wants his people to succeed. He wants his kids to succeed. But he also is just a really fun, uh, easygoing guy. And I think a lot of that, when my mom said that on that phone call, I kind of saw myself as a bit of a joker, uh, someone who liked to mess around a little bit. And then I thought like, how could I be principal? I'm like, well, maybe principal should be fun. Maybe principals, maybe the vision of what I have as a principal isn't what I need to be. Maybe who I am could be effective in my leadership role. And Sean just shows us in spades how he has this nature that's just so easygoing, welcoming, nurturing, uh, but also takes his job very seriously, which is probably why uh, his his district and him have had such great success. And the people at his district were absolutely wonderful. And I, I just know you're going to love this podcast. It was such a great conversation. Uh, we, we talked about some really good questions, uh, like the idea of how do you make tough decisions when you know you're going to get backlash? Like, how do you actually make those decisions? And Sean... Uh, you know, just uh, ace that question. It was amazing to see his response. So I hope you enjoy this episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Hey everyone, it is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I actually have a very special guest today, uh, Dr. Sean Carey. And how how do I say the district? Is it Enum Claw, am I saying that right? You got it. Yeah, Enum Claw. Yeah, yeah. So Enum Claw District in uh, in Washington State. I had the privilege of joining you and your staff. Incredible uh, group of people. Incredible staff. Just it was just such an uh, amazing environment. And I say this all the time. They were so warm and welcoming to me, which made my life so easy speaking that day. Right. And uh, the way that you address the staff, you just had this really. Like, especially in this time, I think this is something I really appreciate about how you connected with them. You have this kind of joking, you know, easygoing nature, but also when there's so much adversity that people are dealing with, they're, like you feel so dependable at the same time. I, and that was like, it was just, I, I don't know how you did that mix, to be honest. That was quite, you know, it was quite amazing because sometimes it can be one or the other, like, okay. This guy's funny, but I don't want to bleed. Anything, right? <laughs> right. So like, like I felt you had that, that, that beautiful mix. So Sean, thank you so much for being on the podcast, taking time out of your day. Cause you know, like what does a superintendent have to do right now? Right. Super busy. You know, it's not like you're busy with anything. So no, I, there's nothing going on. <laughs> he's right. So I so appreciate you being here today. So if you can just uh, introduce yourself, uh, tell us what you do today and kind of how you got to that space. All right. So, Thanks, George. Number one, you, um, thank you so much. I mean, you're being way too kind. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to think that uh, we are we're part of the norm and less of the 
um, you know, that anomaly out there. Mm -hmm. I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, our school district, we certainly do. Uh, we certainly do love the work that we do. I work with a lot of great people, people who, quite frankly, they make me, they make me look good. Right. Um, so it's not, it's not about me at all. Um, so uh, to the question, so how did I, how did I get here? Well, um, um, kind of a long road. Um, and, um, and I, 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 and maybe that's not so fair, but, um, you know, maybe it's the road that everybody takes, but, mm -hmm. you know, moving from, moving from classroom teacher through, um, a building administrator and into the central office and then ultimately into this job. That's kind of, I, I guess that's kind of the, the road that most people take. I will tell you, there's just this really kind of, um, I don't know, I tell this story and, and, and then I maybe lose some, some credibility points with regard to being a, a superintendent. Right. So I'm going to tell it and, and you can just take it for what you want. So, um, actually never really wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. Didn't, um, but I had this, I had this girl I was really interested in and um, she and I had been dating since right. high school and she was going to go to a, a local college here in, in, in Washington state. And so um, she started college. I said, uh, you know, I, I guess I could go to that college too. Um, and then she decided to become a teacher. So she started taking t education courses and I said, well, geez, I, I kind of want to hang out with her. So I guess I could take these classes too. Really no big deal. <laughs> this is not where it is. <laughs> exactly. so, so I'm, I'm taking these education classes right. and lo and behold, at the end of the <laughs> four years, I've got this degree in education that I didn't necessarily want. So, okay, <laughs> but, so is she still in your life? Like it's my wife. It's been my wife for oh, the last wow. 26 okay. years. Um, and we've been together for over 35 years. Um, so yeah, no, this, well, this is, I think we gotta, life. we gotta shift to like love advice over. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, there are lots of things about my life that are maybe <laughs> outside of the norm. And I would certainly say that maybe that that's, that's something that, uh, is unique to just kind of the, my situation. I, I don't, I don't know too many people who have married their, their high school sweetheart. Um, but, uh, yeah, but anyway, that's how I got into education. Really, I got it's by accident, and it's also because I was chasing a girl. Right. Um. So, um. I hope that doesn't serve as a you know kind of a, um. You know, any type of uh, owner's manual for people who want to be educators in the future. And you're like, I, you know, she, I, I gotta, I gotta keep moving up here. I'm, you know, I, she's not gonna be impressed. I actually, it's funny because like most of my jobs when I first started is like. Uh, where do I want to teach? Well, you know, this person I'm dating, she lives there. So I was, so I'm like, like, oh, okay, that's kind of in common, but you know, not, they all dump me. So it's a little bit different story. So you obviously found the, the successor that, that is, uh, that is not where I expected to this to go. Well, Hey, that's, that's part of the journey for me. That was part of the journey for me. And, and quite honestly, I mean, she's, she's my biggest fan. She's, she's definitely the one who keeps me together in terms of, uh, you know, making sure that I'm I'm staying on the path that I should I should be on. She's the one who reminds me. You know what? Kids don't care what you know until they know that you care. Um, and um, she's an educator as well, so you know that uh, that's the thing that uh, is also part of the glue that keeps us together too. So, um, hey, hey, I gotta. So you know, I don't usually do this on this on this podcast, but shout out to your wife. <laughs> Just in case she's listening, right? That's, that's really <laughs> incredible. Hey, I get so I gotta ask you this, right? I wasn't expecting this to go there. So how do you deal with, like, I, I know you got a lot of stuff going on in education, right? Mm -hmm. And there's got to be, like, do you, do you talk about it with your wife? Do you, like, want nothing to do? Do you're like, nah, I need a break from this? Like, how, how do you kind of find that balance? Because I know that it can be, that can be tough, right? Like, because yeah. sometimes you need to get away, right? But if you, you know, you're, you're married to an educator, uh, yeah. it's like, nonstop and you need to, so like, how do you deal with that? I'm sure like a lot of, cause I know a lot of people in education are, you know, that, that their partner is also in education. So like, how do you deal with that? Yeah. So that's a, that's a great question. And a lot of people ask us that, um, um, I'll tell you that our, our circle of friends are probably more educators than right. we have otherwise. Um, and so it's, um, you know, we try to spend a little bit of time talking about education, but most of the time, not so much just right. because it's talking shop and, right. and, you know, we've got similar experiences that we have, um, you know, um, and there are times when, you know, 
depending on what I, it is that I decide to share with my wife about my day, right. um, she might end up lecturing me about how I got it completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should have done something a different way. Right. Um, right. And so I don't need to lecture at, the, at that time of the evening. So <laughs> we talk about things other than other than um, education. Um, but no, it's it's um, definitely again, it's a part of the glue that kind of uh, holds us together. Um, part of our life in terms of, uh, you know, the people that we have in our lives, too. Um, but it's not the it's not the it's not mm -hmm. the center of everything. Yeah, I think I think it's really good to kind of, you know, it's good to have someone that you can confide in, you can trust, obviously, you know, share those and like, we'll give you so my my one brother is actually in education. Mm -hmm. And and he doesn't do like, compliment sandwiches. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't say like, Oh, like, I really appreciated this thing you did. But you know, I would <laughs> yeah. he just goes right to the meat. He just tells me, that, um, you know, that was stupid and things like that. And sometimes it's really frustrating. But you know, I, I, I know it's not filtered. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so mm -hmm. I think sometimes I, you appreciate people like that in your life, as long as you know, they got your back, right? Like that they're not just doing it because it's fun for them to point out what's wrong. Hey, I, I actually I didn't notice this until we got into this part of the podcast. But you kind of lift it up. And I saw, are you a Seahawks fan? You big Seahawks fan? I am. Yes, absolutely. Go Hawks. Oh. Okay, so I okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a little Seahawks thing and we're gonna All tie right. it to education. Okay. All right, bring it. So I actually went to um I went to a Seahawks game. I can't, it was like maybe a year after they won the championship. You're gonna hate this. I actually saw when they I was actually at the Super Bowl where Russell Wilson Aww. threw it. I was there. So I'm sorry about that. Aww. That hurts, right? That does hurt because I, I, I was actually in that, that was dream season. Yeah. And, and Marshawn Lynch was amazing. Right. Wow. And I was and everyone like we were it was actually that was so so for anyone who doesn't know about this game, and this wasn't what I was going to talk about, but I got to tell you here, because it was like, it was super weird. Uh, so the Seahawks were basically on the one yard line. And if they would have got a touchdown, they, they basically win the game. And they could have, they had one of the best running backs in the league and they decided to throw and it got intercepted and they lost. And so like that, I got to tell you this, because I, I was in the stadium when that happened. And basically the Seahawks fans had assumed they were going to win. The Patriot fans thought they were going to lose. And then that happened. And it was like, nobody was, it was just like, what happened? What just happened there? Exactly. It was the we It was like, it wasn't like just this ex crazy, you know, joy that you would expect it from a winning team. It was like, what? Like, yeah. what? it was so weird. It was the, one of the weirdest endings I've ever seen to a game. Well, George, I was sitting on the floor in front of the TV <laughs> and I just was like, yeah, I can't even what imagine. What happened? That hurt. Okay, that was not where I was going with this. <laughs> okay. I, for, I actually forgot I was at the game. But this is, I want I want you to see the connection to this in education. See if, if you, because I always talk about this actually. I went to Seattle mm -hmm. and I had been to a couple NFL games at that point in my life. Mm -hmm. was, this is before that Super Bowl actually. And uh, it was amazing because they stand, I don't know if they still do this, they stood the entire game, every fan. I'm like this. This is the whole game. This is what we're doing all game. Like, yeah, oh yeah. As right? a season ticket holder, that is what part of my job. The whole game, right? Because like, because sometimes you know, you, I'm like, ah, oh, this this guy in front of me standing. This is so annoying. And I'm like, well, this is. I guess that if I want to see the game, I got to stand up too, right? Because like you have like the one guy, but there is not. It's not just one person. It's like everybody. And. The thing when I remember I walked around there and, you know, they have this really this championship feel uh, like the whole city. Right. It just it felt something when I was walking down there by the game. And I always kind of use this example like, specifically with that culture, because I hear a lot of people say like, oh, we need to embrace failure. And I understand the intention by it. Mm -hmm. But I always I always say like success breeds success. Right. People want to be a part of that winning culture. People want to identify with that. And so like. I don't know if there's any like if there's any education tie-ins like you see that with there, but like like how do you see that connected to like what you do in your school district? Because that to me, I like I will never. The game was one thing; it was like the before and the after, like just kind of being around that and how people took so much pride in that the culture of success in that in that city. Yeah, no, absolutely. So that and that is that is the tie-in to education. I mean. Um, I say the job of every teacher in an organization is to try to build a culture where there's a culture where where 
success is, is kind of expected. It's, Mm -hmm. I mean, um, no one, no one builds a culture that's, or wants to build a culture that's built on failure. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so you just have to do all of the things and you have to continue to do all the things and continue to think about all the things that you need to do in order to build that culture of success. Um, and, um, I would say to you that as a, as a classroom teacher, that was one of the things that, you Mm -hmm. know, highly competitive. Um, I was a fourth grade te- teacher for many years. And one of the things that I would always tell my kids is, you know, I really do love my my fourth grade partners down the hall, mm-hmm. but I want our class to always win. Right. I want us to be first. Yeah. I want us to I want us to do the best. And I would say that as, you know, when I moved into building administration, I loved my colleagues that I, was, I, mm-hmm. I worked with. But I would always tell my staff, hey, guess what? I want this to be the school of choice. I want people to say, you know what? I don't want to go to any other school. I want them, I want to go to that school where they where, the, where those teachers are teaching. And the same thing was true for the, the districts I've worked in and also for the, the place that I'm in right now. And that is, I want this to be the district of choice. Right. I want people to say, you know what? They've got it figured out there. They want the they want the most, they want the best for their kids. And I want my kids to be a part of that. I want them to be a part of that culture. Mm-hmm. Well, here's here's actually like I, I'm fascinated that you said this because there's almost this like competition's bad, right? All about collaboration. And I've always talked about the notion of competitive collaboration, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I will tell you this. I taught grade four. I'd be the exact same way. You know, if I was down the hall, I'd be like, yeah, we're going to be better in Sean's class, right? <laughs> we're gonna do that too. But well, here's, a, here's a thing that I know about you just connecting with you. And I'm sure you can tell us about me. If you ever came to my class and said, you're doing, that's pretty awesome what you're doing. Can you like walk me through that? I'd be like, yeah, absolutely. And that, that's why I talk about that notion of competitive collaboration. We, we need to push each other to be better, but my door is always open to help people. And I think like, it's not just because we do this all the time in education, we go pendulum, right? Mm -hmm. It's like when I was in education, it was like uh, times tables at the board and like we would like crush other people and that was like everything right and then I be- went to like totally the opposite end where like hey let's let's really talk about the answer and it's like well no like well, there's got to be a little bit of that too right there's got to be kind of some of that push right and so I, I that's what I know about like I know you strive for that in your district I guarantee 100 and actually I can prove it there's evidence of this because when I was at your district uh, another district said, "Hey, they, they, I actually got uh, connected with one of your other districts because they found out I was there, and then they booked me as well. It wasn't like, well, we're just keeping them for ourselves, right? Like you said, what was going on? Yeah, and and that that to me is like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be the best as long as you're not like, let's crush that other school because you are ultimately crushing other kids too, right? No, and you're and you're spot on about that. Yeah. I no, it's not about it's not about um, yeah. it's not about dragging anybody else down or yeah. making them feel like lesser. It's always about every everybody rising, rising, everybody Love rising, that. ever all all boats rising with the tide. So. And I, and and you embody that so well in your district. And I lo- I I so I you have no idea how much I love that you talked about that that competitive nature because I don't think like. I just think it's almost become a dirty word, and I'm like, ah, and no, no one's trying, no one's trying to beat down. Like I think it used to be, it used to be, in some situations. Like this was a conversation that uh, I remember having. People are like, you know, sometimes teachers will say, "Look, I've been working on my stuff for like 20 years. I'm not just handing it over to you." And my my very first, my very first, I was warned about this over and over again as I went into education. The very first interaction I had with a teacher who was going to be my partner across the hallway, mm-hmm. she said, to, I'll never forget, she said to me, uh, her name was Marlene Bertram. She said, hey, I've been teaching for a while. If you need anything, take whatever you need. And that, and that just like, that changed like, that changed everything for me. I There's no way I would have survived that year if she didn't do that, right? Because I didn't know what I was doing, to be honest. I would love to say that I, I, I did, but... Uh, yeah, I, I would have struggled and she helped me so much. And like, I'm so grateful uh, for her to this day. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to talk about this analogy I shared with you. Um, okay. And you you know, the one about the refing, right? Yes. So we talked about this. And so, you know, as a superintendent, like obviously st- stuff is, it's not like everything's just smooth sailing lately, right? There's got to be some stuff that you deal with. And the analogy I shared with you is that I'm, I, I liken being a superintendent, actually, to be honest, you, a teacher, not yeah. just superintendents, uh, but basically anyone in education to when I used to ref basketball, especially at the high levels. And the thing that I always say is that 
when you ref basketball uh, or any sport, you are wrong 100% of the time to 50% of the people. It just depends on which 50%, uh, whatever the day, right? And it, it feels like that all the time. And, you know, people feel that. So how how do you, instead of like talking about like some of the things that you struggle with, how do you how do you make tough decisions when you know that you're, you're going to get pushback from s- some group right away? Like, how do you, how do you actually come to the decisions that you make? Cause I think that is actually much more important than necessarily the decisions you make or the, the things that you have. Cause like people, you know, sometimes if you're just making a decision because you're scared of this group, mm-hmm. probably not going to be best for kids. Right. So like, okay. how do you, how do you make decisions when you know you're going to get pushback on stuff? That is, that's a, that's a great question. George. I actually just uh, made that question up and that was a good question. George. Yeah. I, 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 I was, I, was pretty I, I think you probably have a book somewhere. And you're I just off I was, I'm not going to lie. I'm like, that is a good question. <laughs> All right. Well, so I will say to you that, um, as this has been my, this has kind of been my mantra ever since I was a building administrator mm-hmm. and, and this was shortly after I became a, a, a parent. I became a dad. Um, I would always say to everyone and anyone, whenever I had the opportunity to be in front of a group that I got to talk to, especially educators or those people working with me, um, I would say I would say to them that um, making decisions, um, especially tough decisions, has to be grounded in what it is that you would want to have for your own kids. Mm -hmm. You make decisions or you have to make decisions that are based on what you think is right. What you think is going to benefit kids, the majority of kids, hopefully all of kids in the most impactful way. And you have to see it through the eyes of not just a person who's doing a job, but as a person who is invested because you have your own kids that could benefit from that. Mm-hmm. So my, I, make, I, make decisions, I make decisions based on what it is that I want for my own kids, my own biological kids. That actually when, so for me, this is, this is as, as a parent, this is, I'm taking off my educator hat as a parent, this is my expectation. So Sean, if my kids are in your district, I would say to you, Sean, all I ask of you, never put my kid in a class that you wouldn't put your own kid. And that's that's what I want 100%. That's yeah. what I want 100%. Yeah. And I would say that to my staff too, all the time. Mm-hmm. If I walk into a classroom and I see something that I wouldn't want for my own kids, mm-hmm. I've, got, I've got concerns and those concerns have to be addressed. Yeah, and I, I so appreciate that because I think sometimes um, we can get caught up in how some of the adults are talking, right? And it's, I, I, I always try to assume positive intent. I, I really do, right? And even, even as a, as a principal, uh, you know, in my time, sometimes when I feel like a conversation was getting lost for me, right? Like was going in a, a negative direction, I would actually say like to uh, uh, the parent, the caregiver, hey, hey, we are here to do what's best for your child, correct? And I would actually, I wouldn't just make it as a statement. I'd make it, I'd ask it as a question mm-hmm. because I wanted them to uh, to agree with that statement to center them and myself. Because I think sometimes um, it would be easy for my ego to get lost in that situation where it's now like, okay, now I just, I'm just gonna like argue with this parent because like, I, I'm not liking the situation. And then you could easily lose yourself and not focus on the kid, right? And so I think that was for me, like I always tell people when you're having some of those tough decisions, you have to have that kind of centering moment where people are reminded why they are there. Right. And it's not like, Hey, and I know, I know this about you too, because I know this is, this is like, it's not at the expense of adults and it's not like screw the adults. Let's like, just make sure the kids are okay. Right. It is like you do everything to take care of the adults, to make sure they take care of the kids. Like it's there, they do go hand in hand, but it is that centering question because I think sometimes um, we can do things that's really easy for us as adults, but doesn't actually benefit kids. And so long-term that's not going to benefit the adults either. Right. right. Uh, you are, you are new 
ish to the school district, right? So you actually, I think you came there from what I remember. Uh, you came there during, like, during COVID. Like you actually, the school wasn't even uh, in person when you started, correct? That is correct. So how so- how has that experience been? Like, what was that like? You know, being a superintendent where you didn't have like the the maybe the traditional experience of what a new superintendent would would go through. Yeah. Well, so, um, yeah, that's that, yeah, that's, that's my reality. And I would say (laughs) to you that, um, um, it was, um, it was, it was jarring because, you know, I, of course, over the course of my, um, my, um, my, my tenure in, in education, I've seen a number of, uh, superintendents and I've been able to watch them kind of come into a district and do work and, and, um, you know, impact, um, impact systems and so on and so forth. And, and, um, all with, without some of the, um, I guess the external forces that you have no control over Mm -hmm. and coming into a school district where you've got this just monster of a, of a force that you have absolutely no control over and, people expect you to have control over because that's what they're used to. They're used to superintendents being able to control certain things. Um, that was, that was really challenging. Um, challenging to, um, number one, shift my mindset to a place Mm -hmm. where I could, um, truly, uh, uh, internalize the fact that I was not going to be able to, I wasn't going to be able to beat COVID. There was not a, there was not a formula for me to, you know, um, you know, um, overcome COVID and, and we just do things, you know, as they've always been done. Um, and so that was, that was one of the biggest challenges. Um, um, and also helping people understand that, um, you know, things were going to look different. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was again, trying to get people to a place where they could understand and they could, they could really, uh, um, I guess come to, come to accept the, the, the reality that things would be different um, again. Was, uh, was, this, of- was this your first superintendent position? Absolutely. Yeah. This- okay. I, I'm actually, as I'm listening to you, I got to ask you this question and I'm just, I'm curious about this because, you know, kids, you know, kids entering school, you know, wearing masks, right. And this is their first year and things like that too. Right. There's a little bit of feeling like, Oh, like, you know, kids, lost have lost out on some of the experience that we had when we first entered school and i'm listening to you i'm like it kind of sucks you kind of you lost out on like you know like that should be like a massive celebration how exciting that is and you like is do you feel that a little bit like i'm just kind of listening to you i'm like oh that kind of like sucks a little bit right because like what what an amazing like to become a superintendent it's you know it's i know to be honest i know there's a lot of openings the last couple of years too I'm not saying that there wasn't like a bunch of uh, people saying like, you know, maybe it's time to retire, but they like that. I feel like, you know, probably like, I guess, listen to you. I did. I just felt like, Oh, like a lot of new teachers lost out on like what they envision, right. A lot of new principals, you know, people in new positions. Like how, how was that? Like you like, is that like, okay. Like, how are you dealing with that? I don't know if that's like well, even the thing or are you dealing with that? Well, no, no. So honestly, um, that, that, that first experience, the first experience as superintendent, um, not being able to, to do things that I had normally seen done um, by other superintendents, it just sucked for, <laughs> lack, of, for lack of a better you word. Said that, you said that, but I was like, oh, no, 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 it was not, it was not cool. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, the experience that, uh, that uh, we had when you came in, you spoke with, uh, st- spoke with my staff. That was the uh, first opportunity that I had had right. um, to have the staff in run- one room um, or one, right. one space um, and actually address them, you know, face to face on, on, on a zoom meeting. Um, and so that was a real treat for me. Um, that's what I expected. That's what I was expecting the first day that I actually walked into the district. But unfortunately, circumstances just didn't allow for that to happen. So, and and kudos to you. And I got to do this. Your staff was amazing. So, Edom Claw. <laughs> Seriously, they were amazing. They were just an amazing group of people, and they were just so welcoming and stuff like that. And I don't want to downplay any of the crappiness of the last little while. Not 
pretend or pretend that people didn't deal with adversity. I, I will say it was amazing. The energy and the excitement that your staff had to be in that space. And that just like, I want to just make sure that people hear that. Because I think a lot of times people are like, oh, yeah, teachers. Blah, blah. I'm like, no, these these teachers were, were just pop. And you asked, like, there's something that you obviously had done to get them, you know, not, not, I know, and I know even if it was you alone, you would never take credit for it. But I know <laughs> that you as a staff, you had, like, what did you, how did you get people like excited, prepared to come back to, you know, not, not necessarily what was. Uh, that that experience that they wanted, but they they had you know a certain excitement even with a lot of adversity still coming their way. Yeah. So um, and you're right. This was this was not this was not the Sean show. It wasn't it wasn't right. You know, you know we should be excited. I, even if it, I know you never admit it, it doesn't yeah. matter. So, so um, but I would say to you that um, I think that one of the reasons why um, teachers were so excited was because it was a it was just kind of a little slice of normalcy for them. Um, this is something that was, this is mm-hmm. that opportunity for us to gather together is something that has been a part of the tradition of this school district for many years, way, way before I, I was even thought about being here. Um, and so um, I think it was just a, it was an opportunity for them to have just a little bit of normal in a still, a still environment, an environment that still isn't very, it's not normal all the way. Right. And so I think that that's where that energy and enthusiasm came from. And then I think, you know, another part of it was it was an opportunity for them to finally meet, if mm-hmm. you will, right. their superintendent. Um, and even though I'd been working with them and they'd heard from me and I'd been on, you know, I made I'd made commercials and I'd made, uh, right. you know, videos and so on and so forth. And they had opportunities to meet me that way. It wasn't the same. It was an opportunity for us to be in the same room, to share the same space, to, you know, listen to the same things together. Um, and that makes a difference. It just makes a difference. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I'm going to say this for anyone that is aspiring uh, to be a leader and just, just as a kudos to you, because this is something that I, I, I get from our conversations. This is something that you are the person that always gives credit and then you will take whatever brunt you need to serve your people as well. Even in, in both cases, uh, even if it's not like you, you will give it away when it's deserved and you will take it when it's not. And I know, and I, so I appreciate that about you because uh, that that's something honestly, I think great leaders do and you're the staff, the school and <laughs> see and like, you're like, no, which is, you're kind of just proving my point, right? Like you just, yeah, they, they were excited. And I know that, uh, Jill, uh, is it, it's Jill Burns. Burns yes. Burns. Jill Burns is an amazing leader, uh, on your staff. Uh, and just, you obviously did something to really help them through a time where like, it could have been just easy for you not to connect with them. It could have been easy for you not. Cause like, you're like, well, what, like, what are they going to expect? I'm new here kind of thing. Right. Like the, the bar is low and I know you said it high. So I know that we talked about this. I know you kind of uh, touched upon this too. So like, obviously a lot of things have changed, uh, in education. And I know, I know from your nature, there's no way that you're going to be like in two years from now, I just hope we get back to what we used to do. And I just, I know that's not, that's not you. So like what, what in two years, like we go through this and we're not like masking and all this other stuff. Like what, what do you see would be like, Hey, this is how we know that we didn't just get through this, but we actually thrive that we're, we're better off now. Like how, what, what will that look like? What, how do you see, like, how would you measure if you were like your, your district was successful um, during this time? Yeah. Another really great question. So um, I would say to you that um, one of the, the biggest things that, um, you know, if I, if I were projecting out two years from now, we're not dealing with, you know, all of the things related to COVID is that um, we really have embraced the this idea that um, the system that we've been operating in for the last, gosh, hundreds of years, um, it's it we're we're not using that same system anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're we're thinking about educating in a totally different way. Um, we know, I mean, we know, we know what students were able to thrive in an environment like that. 
like this and and we know what students weren't able to thrive in an environment like this and we've had to do some things differently in order to make sure that um, we could level the playing field so to speak with all of our students so that they could all get something in an environment like this and i hope that that's something that just becomes our new mindset now Mm -hmm. Um, and i i won't say that that doesn't exist or it didn't exist before covid Mm -hmm. um i would say to you that now it exists in a way that you can't ignore. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it really does, it really does, it really does force people to really, um, consider, uh, whether or not what they're doing is reaching students in a, in a meaningful way. Um, so just really, I, I hope that what it, I hope that what we see two years from now is just a change in the mindset, a -hmm. change in the model, um, a change, a change that's needed to happen for some time now. So I'm going to, I'm going to share a story with you and I I want, I think, I think you might've given me the answer to what I'm going to ask you already, but it's just something that really resonated with me. I I remember years ago I was on, started getting on social media, Mm -hmm. started, you know, reading blogs and just seeing I, and seeing education like in a totally different way. And like, oh, this is what we're doing right now. Some of this stuff is not working. Like some, like uh, some of it, you know, like I'm not, and I think a lot of people think like, let's get rid of reading and writing. I'm like, no, that's, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I just feel there's so much more we could do and connect. And there's a reason. And I, I felt like just things, just my eyes just opened in a totally different way. And it was like the matrix, right? Like, you know, the, the blue pill, red pill kind of thing. Right. And I just saw things different. And I remember we were at a table at a conference and I was talking about this, like, we need to really change education. We need to do this. And there is a, a gentleman there who probably was like 65, 70 years old. And he just said, we've been talking like this forever. Nothing's going to change. And I was like, Oh my God. Like, and like, you kind of feel like, like there is a little part of me, like a little arrogance. I think this is something, there's, there's a reason I tell the story because I often think we like, we think we're the first ones to ever say education should change, but it's like, no, nah, actually a lot of people have been saying this, but like, but maybe, and may, like I said, maybe you answer this, like why are, is the generation that's in education right now? Why are, why is this going to be the generation that we believe will actually create something way better than what we actually envisioned of what we could do for kids? Like, is it, is it that, is it that big jolt that we've had in the world? Like, well, how do you see it? Well, so George, you already know this. I mean, we're creatures, human beings are creatures of oh. habit. And so, um, we always, we always, we go back to whatever, whatever we're most comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Um, this disruption has lasted way longer than most people right. have, whatever have, have imagined. And so um, I would say to you that um, going back to what we were used to mm-hmm. won't be an option because right. it will be it will be somewhat erased from our memories. Yeah, our collective memories. Um, we will have gotten used to doing things differently. If and especially if we're, if we're to um, continue to be um, a system that actually. Um, does what the system was meant to do, which is to, to um, provide the masses with education that would, that would ultimately help them to be successful in the world mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or the worlds around them. And so, yeah, we, will, we won't have the opportunity. We won't have the opportunity to go back to what it is that we were most comfortable with because it will be foreign to us by the time this is all over. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that I know you and I are lying on quite a bit is – like I, my goal is to help kids find a pathway to success that is meaningful to them. That doesn't mean I want every kid to go to college because like Absolutely. that's going to work for some is, and it's not like, I think when, when sometimes I say that, like my goal is not to get every kid to college. Some people say, yeah, it's okay if some kids don't succeed at that. And I'm like, no, 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 just hold on a second. I'm not saying, I'm saying they will find success, but college is not the path for them, but they could find like I, f- I find there's a lot of people that go to college who are, let's be honest, are miserable people. And Absolutely. it's like, right. And it's like, but they were ingrained in their head. This is how I find a life that is satisfying to me is I have to find, you know, figure out this predetermined path. And I think that's something that's really important. I remember uh, when I actually went to, I went to uh, 
when I went to university in education, we had this prof who was like, we thought it was like just this wacky guy. Like he was just, just, just like what this guy is like, he was telling us like, Hey, we, I want you to figure out what you want to learn. And, uh, I'm not even assessing you. I want you to grade yourselves and do this stuff. I'm like, who is this guy? Like, what, like, what happened to this guy? Right. Best class I ever took. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was like, and, and I remember just thinking he was kind of like, just crazy. Oh, yeah. He's crazy. And then, and then I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm, I'm the crazy guy now. Like I'm the guy who's like advocating for a lot of the same things, but I didn't really, I didn't really real. It did. It took me years to realize how much I loved that class, how much that brought out that, how much that actually like, I'm like, so this guy's going to let me mark myself, but a George, you got an A, right. And not like a Canadian a, but like a, a letter a. And so, yeah, I just remember, I remember that. And then I actually did like an incredible, I was like really into it. And I, I, you know, I just, he just, it was like, and then I was like, that guy manipulated me. Like what happened there? Like what what's going on? Right. But just some of the things that you you start to realize is as you get older, you have more experience, right? And there is there is like helping kids find their own pathway is something that I'm really adamant about. Not like predetermining who what makes them successful, who like that we someone else decides that. And so uh, this is the last question I'm going to ask you. And you you've been amazing. I love talking to you. I'm so glad that you you, you took the time to be on the podcast. Um, if you if anyone. In a time of like such uncertainty, somebody's listening to this and has been thinking about leadership, you know, wants to maybe go into admin, but they're like, nah, I don't want to touch this. Like, I, I want nothing to do with this. Like, what advice would you give them? And maybe, and maybe who knows? Well, I guess we'll find out what kind of day I caught you on. <laughs> Cause you might be like, you're right. Depending on the day. Right. But like, <laughs> right? What, what advice would you give them? Uh, you know, someone who's like, looking, I want to, you know, I want to lead through this time, even though this is probably a really tough time to do this. Mm -hmm. Like what advice would you give someone who, who wants to go into like school admin? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I guess it would depend on the day, <laughs> and, on the day. Like, all of the things that had happened in that day. If you were, yeah, yeah. you asked me this question, but I would say to you that, um, you know, to those people who would, consider or, 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 or even think about considering um, being a leader in education right now, this is the perfect time. Mm -hmm. It's the perfect time because it's the time when you can, um, and I, I, don't, say I, don't, I don't want to step, I don't want to step, I, I don't want to say anything that I shouldn't say, but you can think outside of the box. Yeah. Yeah. You can really think outside of the box and you can do things that, um, quite frankly, won't be seen as weird. Right. Um, and you can determine what the new normal will be. Mm -hmm. You can help determine what that new normal will be. Um, this is a system that needed to be changed a long time ago. Yeah. And you're right. I, I, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to what we talked about earlier. I mean, mm -hmm. um, those teachers that were most impactful in my life, they were the ones who were thinking outside of the right thinking outside of the box. They were doing things that were different. They were let, yeah, they were letting me grade myself. They were letting me come up right. with projects that I was interested in. And those are the ones, those are the teachers that I, I remember fondly. Those are the ones that I, I think about often and I want to emulate. Um, if you want to be a leader and especially a leader during that time, this is the opportunity for you mm -hmm. to be that kind of, that kind of leader, the leader that, helps people think about the possibilities that are different than the current reality. Mm -hmm. Is that just a little, I'm not going to lie. There's a little piece of me. That's like, I always used to say, you know, what's the best, if you become a principal, it's always great to follow a principal that was terrible before. It's kind of like, Hey, everything sucked before. <laughs> so you might, if you're going to go in now, it's, it's no matter what you do, it's only going to be up. Right. <laughs> that's true. That's There's a true. little bit of that too. Actually, it's funny because uh, your district actually bought the Innovate Inside the Box for your entire staff, right? And it's like, hey, we need to think outside the box. And people say, like, why, 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 George, are you advocating for for like working within that box? And I'm like, well, okay, here's here's the deal. I think this is a really important. And I I know is that you as a superintendent, you know, be I cannot, I will never come to your district and say, hey, everyone. Don't worry about grades. Don't worry about your scores. And Sean's like, what? Why would we bring this guy? Like, this is gonna right. It is recognizing, hey, there is 
a box mm -hmm. that we do work in at this point. Mm -hmm. We're going to do really incredible things while we are shifting that box and changing what that box looks like and actually maybe totally getting rid of it. But you do, you do like the thing is, is that you can't really change things if you're fired. You can't right. really change things if you don't have a job in, right. in, in that sense, right? And so it is, I think a lot of times, and this is this is one of the things I really appreciate about uh, Edom Cloth. You are, you are working with inside of what you got to do, but you're changing the box within the constraints and people are like pointing to you and you can see how innovative a lot of the things are happening in your district. And then people are going to start pointing to like, why can't we do what Edom Claw is doing? Right? right. And then that's, that's what starts changing it too. But a lot of people say, well, we can't do that because of this. And it's like, why can't you? Like yeah. who says that? Right? Like, yeah, okay, yeah, we got to deal with this too. Right. But in like one of the things I said to your staff is like, it, we can develop really good test seekers, but it doesn't mean they're good learners. You develop great learners. The, the test will be fine. Don't okay. even worry about that. Right. So it, it, I, I, I love talking to you today. I'm so glad. And mm -hmm. I had such a blast connecting with you. And uh, I, I was, I know that I'm like, I'm not like your parent or anything like this, but I was so proud of you that day watching you interact with your staff. And I know I'm like, who am I to be proud of someone I just met that day? But it was just, I knew you came into not the ideal situation that a superintendent mm -hmm. comes in, like literally waiting a year to address your staff. And you were just, you were just fantastic. I was just uh -huh. so thoroughly impressed. And it doesn't matter if I'm impressed because I'm gone, right? <laughs> Your staff was so impressed with you. So we'll, gi we'll give it a few years and see what they think three years from now. Yeah, that's, yeah let's let us let time yeah. tell. <laughs> but yeah, you, you're an amazing job. So anyone, hey, Sean, thanks so much for taking the time to be with me today. Uh, anyone listening, uh, check out uh, Sean's uh, information. You can connect with him on social media. All, all his links will be uh, in the description below. And uh, I know that he's such an easygoing guy. If you ever reach out to him, he'll go back to you. He, you are the fastest superintendent ever responding to me ever, just so you know. It was like like within five minutes of asking to be on the podcast, he responded. So I was pretty pumped. Well, that's because, George, I was like, uh, I, this can't be the same guy that was stuck. <laughs> what are you talking about? I, like, I was like, yeah, I, I, I'm glad. You, it was awesome. Anyways, thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful day. All right, thanks.